What about the intangibles? What about the aura around this Niners team? Please because stop saying aura. I will not. It's fun. <laughs> I I don't know how many teams have dealt with as much drama as the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. And, and do, do you think it's weighing on them? Do you think it's something that they can get out from under in the second half of the season? Welcome to the NFL on Fox podcast presented by Verizon, the NFL powered by Verizon 5G. I am your host, Dave Hellman. We've got a loaded Tuesday show for y'all. Week 10 in the books. The Miami Dolphins get a road win right here in L.A. against the Rams to wrap things up. We will cover that game in a little bit. Fox Sports reporter Carmen Vitale coming on to break down Dolphins Rams with me. Also going to spend the bulk of the show talking to Carmen with what our, what we're calling our playoff inspections, taking a look at three specific teams sitting on the playoff bubble, wild card teams, teams hovering near the 500 mark, and what their prospects look like, how we feel about the way they've played, where we think they're going. Really fun exercise to try to look at some of the wild card prospects and what the playoff field might look like by the end of the season. Really enjoyed that. That's the bulk of the show. Of course, we'll have our power rankings at the end of this at the end of the episode. See where everybody stands now that the week 10 games are all finished with. But first, as per usual, we start the show with a loaded, jam-packed episode with NFL on Fox Insider Jay Glazer, fresh off the Veterans Day episode of Fox NFL Sunday in San Diego. Fun conversation with Jay about the meaning of Veterans Day to him, about that trip to San Diego, and about several big news stories coming out of Week 10. Great conversation with Jay. First things first, we're recording this on Veterans Day, so before we go any further, just want to extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who has served, everyone who is serving. No, it's it's a big day for, for the armed forces all the way around the world. My favorite holiday of the year, and it is a holiday. It's a holiday to celebrate our veterans. And I've implored my friends who are veterans for years, hey, listen, we celebrate you today. What can you do to celebrate you today? And, you know, I was talking to a really close friend, Brian Stan, last night. It's like Captain America. He's like, you got to understand, like, it's hard for us because we don't do it for the glory. I get it. But if we're celebrating you today, find something you can celebrate, whether it's your teammates, your service, your sacrifice, something, because you deserve it. So every veteran who's listening to this today, Man, I know on behalf of like Fox, when we say we thank you for your service, we truly mean we thank you for your service. But celebrate yourself today. You deserve it, man. You know, I don't think I've ever thought about that. And it's such a good point. I mean, serving in the military is such a selfless act. And I'm sure it is a little bit of a departure to celebrate that on a day like today. But you're absolutely right. I mean, there is no shame. And that is absolutely something you should do. It, it's funny because... You know, a charity years ago called MVP, we would go around. I'd say, hey, give me something you could celebrate. And something you're proud of, you could celebrate about yourself. And they would go around and it would be anything but something to take pride in. And finally, I'm like, no, you got to find something. You just keep deflecting. And somebody said, well, how are we supposed to be proud of killing somebody? And I said, I'm not asking that. But be proud, celebrate something. And this is finally, somebody said, all right, I'm proud uh, when my um, they they uh, freed a town in Afghanistan. They put the first sandals on these little kids in Afghanistan. Like, there we go. And then somebody said, okay, I got one. I saved this person. Oh, uh, when I lost my friend, his mom gave me his green beret. When I did this, when they, and all of a sudden the room was like, yeah, we found it. We felt it. And for those out there, again, you sacrifice. Like, I've always marveled. You don't know me. You don't know my kid, but you leave your own family to go protect me. And I fell in love, really fell in love with the military. You know, I've trained, I've been able to train troops throughout the world, thank God, with, you know, my um, you know, being coaching mixed martial arts, I got to do it all over the world. But before that, 9-11, well, I was in New York City, uh, didn't know what to do, where to go. People were just crying outside. We knew we were attacked. And I go outside and it was chaos. And all of a sudden, these two fighter, fighter jets came flying over. And I'm like, we're good. 
And literally that day I made my commitment to whatever I could do to, to support our troops, to support our military. And I have for years, you know, I've, I've worked obviously a lot of mental health. Um, and somebody recently, I got an award, um, recently a, a military award um, through the American Legion in August. And I got up and I told a room of a, a thousand veterans, I said, I talk a lot about mental health now, but it was our veterans that gave me the courage to be able to speak about it openly because I did it in these small groups of veterans and athletes together with MVP. And there was no shame. And they all started being vulnerable and open up. And I realized, man, I, I could really help people. I could lift people up. I could coach them. Being of service is what helps me between the years as much as anything. Being of service and having a team. So I had these team of veterans and I was able to be of service and it really helped me with my grade. But our veterans gave me the courage to start talking about mental health publicly. Without them, probably never would have done it. So I owe them a lot. It was a big weekend for you and for the show, obviously. Fox NFL Sunday aired Sunday from Naval Base San Diego this weekend. What was that experience like? And I mean, I've got to imagine it's nice getting hands-on time, face-to-face -face time with service members and veterans. I'm sure it's always a really big weekend for y'all. But we do it every year. And again, like Fox truly supports our troops. I've been at Fox for 21 years. There's not been a year where I have, where, where we haven't gone uh, to a military install, installation for Veterans Day and or Thanksgiving. Some years I've gone to Thanksgiving. I went to, oh my God, on Thanksgiving, Fort Irwin, um, the demilitarized zone up in South Korea where it meets North Korea. Um, where else have we gone? We've gone to every, so we got our Air Force, we've got an Air Force Academy, West Point, Annapolis, Fort Benning, Fort Irwin, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, the guys went to an Air Force carrier before I was there. Um, Qatar twice. Um, but every year, we really, really have the support. And Eric Shanks, our boss, he is so pro-military. And he, we, we used to do it where it was kind of every other year. But I would go the years they didn't go. Now it's everybody every year. And they put so much thought into this. This weekend was great because we got to work. We got to go to Bud's and work with SEALs all day Saturday, which is great. Then be around the Navy, obviously, all day Sunday. We went to the I-Bar, too, uh, which is in Top Gun, the second top, top Gun Maverick, which is amazing. And Terry ended up putting his hat in the bar, so he had to buy everybody drinks. Um, but it's like I just talked about teams. Like, I need teams to get the roommates in my head to talk nicely to each other. There's no better team on the planet. And, you know, one of the stories I had this weekend was the um, Seahawks, uh, Mike McDonald bringing SEALs in two weeks ago. Just two weeks ago. And the whole thing was he brought them in because, like, who better to learn calm under chaos than these guys? But the big thing they really teach is, like, it's team, team, team. When bullets are flying, it's still about team. And, look, you don't need guidebooks in life when things are good. You can just float, right? You just take it. We need some help in adversity when things are bad, when the world's kind of things like it's crashing down. That's when you got to learn to be calm get everything to slow down. What better team to learn that from than these SEALs? So he brought them in and it, it, that was it. Their message is like, look, your game plan is not always going to go to, to plan. But when it doesn't, you guys got to stick together as a team. And eventually you all rise up. You, you know, I have a, a really close friend named J.C. Glick who served for years in the Army. And he has a, a saying, we lift, while, we lift while we climb. Right? We lift while we climb. And I love it. Like you got to climb through adversity, but lift each other up in those times. So when I'm get to be around these guys, man, it's it, it's holiday season for me, man. I love it. It's my favorite holiday. Although I will say I, got screwed, I did get screwed this weekend because the guys got to do cool stuff. They got to do cool stuff. Kurt and TB are shooting these big guns and Gronk's in the opposite, opposite courts and Howie and Stray are doing these waves and and I I got rescued. I was like a damsel in distress. I'm like, and I got rescued by Kurt and TB. And the SEALs, of course, were like, man, they're not rescuing me. Come on. I'm not just going to sit and hide out in a shack. And I was the damsel in distress. But I got rescued by the SEALs. I mean, man. I mean, we can't get a I mean, 50 cal for Jay or something? <laughs> I mean, come on. And they had 50 cals. I did. I know. I'm glad y'all had a great time, though, man. That sounds really fun. It's always a cool show. Every time we go to one, we always say, this is the best trip we ever had. And we certainly said it this time. Okay, so with all of that said, 
I do want to get a vibe check from Jay Glazer coming out of the weekend. I said it on the recap show last night. I know they're only four and five, but the Chicago Bears just seem to be in a big amount of turmoil that would suggest they have a way worse record. Have you heard any hint of any sorts of changes or any of that type of stuff happening? Because, man, it, this feels bleak, even for a team that's only one game under 500. I remember meeting this morning. You know, and that was when I put that story out last Sunday, right about the reaction from Tarek Stevenson. And Kind of, and I, I even told people in the organization, look, I'm going to put this out there, and there's two ways you guys can react. You guys could either be like, oh, no, no, hey, man. And, like, it, it, was, it was that one play. It was a fear of turning the tide of, you know, of an organization. It was that bad. Or you could drop the hammer, take your punishment, right, and let's come together on this. And they didn't. I kind of covered, oh, no, you know, Jay, he walked off and – gathered himself and it was just a walk through. I'm like, you guys are missing the point. This was a teachable moment for you all come together and be like, no, 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 no. You're sitting down. You're taking, you're taking, like, you're taking responsibility for this. This is what needs to happen now. The winning cultures don't deal with this stuff. Get angry, get mad, lift while you climb. They didn't do that. I think that just threw them off. They got stuck in a rut. Um, I do like the personnel they have over there, but they're certainly, we're talking about Navy SEALs. They're not playing as a team. They need to, if, if <laughs> we talked about how Mike McDonald brought in Navy SEALs and Dan Quinn uh, has brought them in also and, and works with them every week now for them to interact with reports, the Bears probably do the same thing. Might not be a bad idea. Their entire schedule the rest of the way is teams that are in the thick of the playoff hunt. So best of luck with that in Chicago. This feels like a very interesting situation. They need someone who could develop this quarterback. Develop. There's not a lot of coaches who could develop players anymore. A lot of them are play callers. A lot of them just want stats so they can either get a head coaching job or, you know, it's 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 not like there's developers. There's the Sean McVay's and the Kyle Shanahan's and the Andy Reid's and what Cliff Kingsbury doing over there, right? There's guys who can develop talent. Um, even like, listen, I, I know the Cowboys are obviously, they're disheveled too. But what Dak did last year, the big thing was, it was Kellen Moore than Mike McCarthy took it over and went back to basics, footwork, developed, worked on these things. And statistically, Dak had a great year last year. So there are developers of these young quarterbacks, but if you don't develop them, it can really stunt you. They need somebody who could develop Kayla Williams. Speaking of Tyreek Stevenson, I mean, this is not quite a one-for-one one. And and the 49ers did manage to win on Sunday, unlike the Bears a few weeks ago with that Hail Mary. But with Debo Samuel and Tabor Pepper, Jake Moody are, we can call it arguing. There's just a little bit of physical contact, but I mean, that that's a bad look for the 49ers. It's a bad look. And I'm curious, is there discipline coming for Debo Samuel? I know they all said after the game it was fine, but that's a strange situation when you've got guys fighting and arguing on the sideline. I don't know what's going to happen with it, but... There, look, sometimes brothers fight, but sometimes there's it's a bigger situation. But it's football. So sometimes guys – what is great about a locker room, unlike the rest of the world, is you fight it out and it's over. And it's done. Where the rest of the world – man, people are just so angry right now. And I've always said if, if the rest of the world could be like a locker room, we have people from all different bike backgrounds. You can say whatever you want, and nobody gets insulted. If you do, you fight it out and it's over, we'd be in a lot better place if we act like a locker room. Yeah, you're you're so right. And not to mention when you get the win, I'm I'm sure that helps. One last thing I wanted to ask you about, and I promise that this is a compliment. I promise it is. Can I sway you that the LA Chargers are just kind of boring in the best way? Like this is a team that is so used to drama and and losing games in the weirdest fashion, losing games they're not supposed to. And here this year under Jim Harbaugh, maybe it's not flashy. But they just play good, sound football and win games. I mean, it it feels like a testament to the culture that he's brought, right? I, I don't think anybody cares if you can't call them flash or boring as long as they're winning. But the culture is, without a doubt, it's different. Jim's a winner. He's a winner. It, like, there's no other way to, to go about it. He's a winner. And, you know, I think with the 49ers, there's so much drama there with him and Trent Balkin. But there's not. He and his GM, who worked for his brother, obviously – Get along great. Everybody there is on the same page with them. All the, the coaches are on the same page with them. 
Um, but the players are buying in. They believe it. And by the way, their personnel still isn't like they still got, they're going to add pieces. Did I win you over at all when I called them boring? Like I truly do mean that in the nicest way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's just going to, as, as you get a whole another offseason now to really build, because last season was about pairing off, right? This season will be about how do we build? Um, and yeah, but again, another year I talk about development. Even though Justin Herbert was, he was great. Can't hurt to continue to develop and learn. Like, listen, man, like, you can never stop learning. I don't care who you are. Like, you, the smart black belts will learn from a white belt if you have to. But you never stop learning. You never stop evolving. So a guy like Justin Herbert, he can continue to learn from Jim Harbaugh, but also drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it. It's not just the learning. It's drilling it over and over and over and over and doing it kind of in the way that he learned from Jim. Yeah, I think this, this team's on the upswing. This is a team that felt a year away, and they're 6-3. and three, And that's what's so cool about it. They got a primetime game coming up this weekend to show their stuff against Cincinnati, show everybody what they're about. I'm really looking forward to that. Jay, always love talking to you, man. And I'll say one more time, thank you so much to any service members, past, present. If you're listening, we really appreciate you. Hope you have a great Veterans Day. And like Jay said, I hope you all take a chance to celebrate yourselves. Jay, we'll talk to you soon, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, as always, to Jay Glazer for hopping on the show. And thank you to Carmen Vitale of FoxSports.com, who's here again, as she often is on Tuesdays, to help me make sense of this crazy league. Carm, what's up? Hi. Yeah, no, this is this is fun. We're, we're having fun. <laughs> we're, we're having fun. We are officially into the second half of the season. It's not it, it, it has so long been apropos to talk about the playoff push. People I saw people calling it separation Sunday where mm -hmm. where the contenders are separated from the pretenders. I think that's fair. And it goes in line with our our game, our exercise today, because yeah. I don't want to talk about the the Super Bowl contenders. Like we know who's at the top of the divisions. In a lot of cases, it feels like we can call several of the division races already. Yeah. So let's talk about the muddy middle. Let's talk about the wild card race and some of the teams that are in the middle of the league as things stand. We decided to do. We're calling this playoff inspections, where we're looking at a handful of teams, three to be exact, from around the league, how they're playing, what the rest of their season looks like, whether they look like a true playoff team to us. We have the rights to the Inspector Gadget theme because that would be really great for dum, this segment. Dum, ba, dum, dum, dum. That one? Yeah. Go, go, Gadget Podcast. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think we do, actually. They're going to tell me later that we have to bleep that out. So <laughs> thanks for that. We'll get some generic bumper music in its place. Three teams... Two of them are in the playoff field right now. One of them is on the outside. Or no, no, I'm sorry. One of them is on the inside. Two of them are on the yes. outside looking in. And it's our job to take a look at this and figure out how we feel about them. I wanted to start with a team that really wasn't all that impressive on Sunday, but they are just getting the band back together. Mm. And I, I've seen... I've seen this going around the NFL community already. Our good friend Kevin Clark, I saw coming out of Sunday, said the season starts now for the 49ers. <laughs> so that's where we're going to start. San Francisco the, 49ers. The San Francisco 49ers. And it says a lot about where you are as an organization. If you can play 500 football for nine weeks yeah. and the season starts now for you. There's not a t lot of teams that have built up that kind of trust. But I do think... The 49ers are one of them. So I'm going to tell you what we're going to do here. Okay. We've got our playoff inspection. Mm -hmm. We've got four categories. Your current level of play, mm -hmm. your remaining schedule, your intangibles. In 2024, maybe we should call that your aura. Your aura? Okay, Gen Z. Your Relax. aura and then your, not over, Gen Z. your overall inspection sticker. <laughs> In New Orleans, we call an inspection sticker a break tag, but I digress. Yeah, yeah, you do. There's there's always... I, we. It's just an inspection. You have to get your... Emissions so, test. Let's give the 49ers an inspection. And like I said, they played your old friends, the Buccaneers, on Sunday. Yeah. And by the lofty standard that we have for them, it wasn't all that impressive a performance. 
No, it was very close to going the other way, as it has been for the Buccaneers, by the way, over the last three weeks. And I know this because I've picked them the last three weeks, and it's at the last second. How's that working out for you? It's not working out for me, but you know what? I pick with my heart, Dave. I know this is why I don't actually gamble very much, because I pick with my heart too much. Leaving that where it is, (laughs) and we can talk about how close the Buccaneers are to having a winning record another time. The 49ers, they struggle on special teams. Defense did buckle down and force a Tampa Bay field goal at the end there in the final minute that set the Niners up to go get the game-winning points. Christian McCaffrey's back, goes over 100 all-purpose. Brock Purdy had his best game in, in several weeks. But where do you stand in general with the recent level of play, knowing that this was their first game with Christian McCaffrey back? Right. Where do you stand on this? Yeah, the 49ers are ascending, and we saw that even before Christian McCaffrey came back, even before their bye week. They've won three of their last four games. Also, if you look at their rankings statistically across the board, whether it's offense or defense, I mean, this is a top five in uh, offense and EPA per play. You've got four, you're averaging 412.4 total yards per game, which is second in the NFL. And then you look at the defense, too, and they're 11th in EPA per play allowed. They're doing their job too. It, it's kind of confounding that they got off to such a slow start, even with all of the injuries that they've had. They've been extraordinarily productive on both sides of the ball. So now with Christian McCaffrey added back into this mix, he is such a catalyst for what Kyle Shanahan wants to do on offense. And I feel like it's just not quite a Shanahan offense without Christian McCaffrey in it. So now that that like missing piece, not that they weren't getting by without him, but now that that missing piece is back in there, I mean, even though statistically they've been doing really well, I think that there's, this is, this is the difference between closing games out and not with Christian McCaffrey back in it. So I only see them ascending. It's weird. We talk so much and we've wrung our hands about what the 49ers haven't been. Yeah. It all looks pretty good statistically. It, it really does. Like, it's I, almost like it's so confusing as to why they were even lacking. I dove into the Niners while we were prepping for this, and I expected to find all this troubling information about their defense. No. They're top five in defensive DVOA. Yeah. And, you know, they've, they've been figuring it out, losing Javon Hargrave earlier in the season. Their pass rush has, has been putting things, you know, trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. At the end of the day, it's all still there for them, and I, I know you can't get results back, but I just think, you know, they had total control of a game against the Rams in the last, like, six minutes, and they were up 10 against Arizona and even had a chance to go in and put that game away before a Jordan Mason fumble. And if those two results don't go sideways, they're 7-2 and two right now, and we're not even having this conversation. We're talking about them comfortably being in position to win the division again and and all that other good stuff that the Niners do. So I think their level of play is just fine, and I think uh, yeah. you agree with me. I do. I think we're in agreement here that if you're going yes or no on these this playoff inspection, the Niners are absolutely playing at a level that is befitting of a playoff team. So I'm going yes. Now, what concerns me, if I have a concern about San Francisco, is... Again, you don't get those games back. You lost to the Rams. You lost to the Cardinals. Two winnable division games. And the schedule is tough. Even if you love San Francisco, they have so much talent. But according to The Athletic, they have the fourth hardest strength of schedule remaining in the entire NFL. They got games against Super Bowl contenders, Green Bay, Buffalo, Detroit, still on the schedule. You see it up here if you're watching. They've also got games against... Uh, division teams still got return games against the Rams and Cardinals coming. You've got a game against uh, Seattle. You've got a game against the Chicago Bears. Even on paper, the easiest looking game here is Miami, and that is a completely different team since Tua Tungavailoa came back from his concussion. So there isn't much in the way of a gimme for San Francisco, and for a team that's already five and four, that does concern me a little bit. I'm not concerned. <laughs> I'm just not. I can't. I got nothing. I, I, I did nothing for you there. No, not really. I mean, yeah, it's tough. But also, if the 49ers are who we think they are and talking through statistically who they've been all season, and you're right, some of those losses could have very easily gone the other way. If I'm telling you that they have the second most productive offense in terms of yardage, uh, across the league, and now they have Christian McCaffrey back, how in the world am I going to think that they can't do that against 
any of these opponents. So yeah. I'm I'm really I'm just I'm not concerned. We've seen them be able to turn it on after bye weeks too. Um, so you know, Chris McCaffrey aside, this is kind of who this team is. They're a second half of the season team. Uh, maybe a second half of games team. I'm just, I'm not concerned. So I'm going to say that I guess no is my answer. Or yes. Yes. Is my answer. We're, we're doing this the opposite way. Yes. I'm they're a playoff team, even with the schedule. So we put our, we did our own inspections here. I would have said no. Cause the schedule does concern me when you've already dropped some winning, uh, some winnable games. And like, like I said, I'm, I'm not worried about San Francisco beating Seattle this coming week. I would guess that would happen. I think they're a better team than the Dolphins and the Rams. But you're talking about playing the Buffaloes and the Detroits of the world. Not saying they can't win those games, but it's the NFL. Logic says that you're probably going to drop one or two of those. And when you're already at five and four, that's the difference. Not so much in making the playoffs, but like having a home game, you know, getting to the point where maybe you could be in play for the buy. I mean, never want to speak too soon, but like the buy almost feels out of the question for San Francisco with yeah. the way that the, Lions the Detroit playing. Lions yeah. are playing this year. So I would have said no, but I hear you. I do think if there is a team that's talented enough to overcome this type of schedule, it's probably San Francisco. It's crazy. You lose Brandon Ayuk for the year with an ACL, which just means that now with Christian McCaffrey back in the lineup, you go CMC, Debo Samuel, George Kittle. Yeah, and Ricky Pearsall got his first Ricky touchdowns P this this last game. So. That trio of skill players, though, and then yeah, yeah Ricky Pearsall, Juwan Jennings, Kyle Uzcheck can yeah. build off of that. But like to have that trio, uh, yes, yes, at after full you strength, lose an All Pro for the on year on top of having the defense that they do. That you know, I, I, yes. I, that's what I'm saying. I just I don't have a lot of concerns about them even going against stiffer competition down the stretch, because if we're going to talk about the 49ers like they're this powerhouse NFC team, then let's talk about the 49ers like they're a powerhouse NFC team. OK, so if that doesn't concern you, what about the intangibles? What about the aura around this Niners team? Please because stop saying aura. I will not. It's fun. <laughs> I I don't know how many teams have dealt with as much drama as the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. And uh, do, do you think it's weighing on them? Do you think it's something that they can get out from under in the second half of the season? Yeah, that is the concern for me with the 49ers is can they keep it together? Because for a large portion of this game against Tampa Bay, it was back and forth. And you see it right there. Debo Samuel's choking out his, his kicker. His long snapper. Is that is that that not was that normal? was the holder, wasn't it? Actually, I, like, yeah, it was the long it was, snapper. It was long Tabor snapper. Pepper. Yes, like first of all, what wh what do you? Long snappers are the most inoffensive players. Period. Like they just they do they have one job and they mostly do it well. And you look at how they're they're struggling in the special teams game. And special teams is already an isolating job. Like if you've never seen football practice before, special teams guys are on the separate field. They're on their own. They're not really a part of the team. And so then to treat your teammate like that, I don't care if it's the heat of battle. That's just unacceptable to me. And could you imagine, you talk about the games where that they've lost that they easily could have won. There are plenty of games that they won that they easily could have lost being this, this one being yeah, one of those. Tampa Bay being one of them. Could you imagine what would have happened if Jake Moody ended up missing that kick and they lost to them in overtime. Could you imagine what the story would be then? Can you imagine what that locker room then looks like now? It's very easy to shrug that off and be like, yeah, I'll go talk to, I'll, I'll go talk to Moody after the game or after I'm done with you guys, like Debo Samuel was talking about in the locker room. It'll be fine. It'll be water under the bridge. That's not water under the bridge if you lose that game. And if you're that volatile, that is something that is concerning to me because you see the really great teams, again, the Detroit Lions being one of them, where they are down, they are never out. And even if they are faced with things like losses, they lost to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they bounce right back. They always are there to pick each other up. They have a wonderful culture in that building. And with all of the drama that started, that predated the season even for, for San Francisco, I can't with good conscience say that this is something that doesn't concern me or that I don't feel like we're teetering on the edge of like, it's just, it's still volatile in San Francisco for me right now. The so no, they don't pass the vibe check. This 49ers team is starting to remind me of like the nineties Cowboys in the mm. sense of just 
the show outside of the show, like the show that has nothing to do with football. Right. And but I I think I mean that as a compliment. Like if there's a team that I think can weather this, it's this one. Like you got Trent Williams got ejected a few weeks ago for throwing a punch in a game. You've got the the Brandon Ayuk, the the contract right, drama contract and the situation. constant back and forth. And then he gets injured. After Debo all Samuel that. has a podcast. Debo Samuel and George Kittle were both on a the subject of a television uh, yes. show last year. I know it didn't come out till over the summer, but you're still having all of that swirling around the team. Am I am I missing anything? I'm Nick, sure we are. Nick Bosa uh, made a political endorsement during during a game. Then well, not during a game, but after a game then, then recently. Wouldn't, then wouldn't talk about it. And then yeah. Oh, by the way, your 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 rookie draft pick got shot. Very unfortunately. But very yes. unfortunately. Oh, like yes, I mean that in a very unfortunate way. Like, and then he comes back, and it's this wonderful story, and like the vibes are turning around from stuff like that, but. I just, I cannot get over Debo Samuel choking out his own teammate. Like, that is just, there's no excuse for that. There's Actually, not. I, I've seen a lot more, I feel like we've seen a lot more infighting this year than we have in years past. And yet, in the second half of seasons. Oh, uh, this is where you're going. Okay. With I mean, the yeah. Niners have had this much personality for a minute at this point. They have. They're 24 and 6 after their bye week the last three years. Yeah. 9-0 and in 2022. Seven and two after the bye last year. 2022 is almost a direct reflection of what we just saw, like, the, the, or what we're seeing currently. Because what they had a week nine bye that year, and they went into it at four and four, and so they were completely were right at 500, and then they ran the table afterwards. It's very that's that's what I was going to say is it's very normal for the Niners to play 500 ball for seven, eight, nine weeks, and then get it together. And I like. It's not great that this Debo confrontation with uh, with Tabor Pepper and Jake Moody happened just now, but if there's a team I think can push past it, it's this one. So they passed that check for me. I'm going to go ahead and speak for you. Yeah. We see we see this team as a as a playoff team. Yeah, absolutely. I okay. mean, I don't think that they are the powerhouse in this conference anymore because I don't know how you argue against the Lions being the best team in the NFC, if not the entire league at this point. And I do think that there are other teams that can contend within the conference, be, you know, be it the Packers or the Eagles are surging right now, but they are absolutely still the standard that we've set for the NFC in general, and they're going to be right in the mix. So I just, I don't see this going any other way. I've seen the Niners dominate from beginning to end, and I've also seen them sneak in as a wild card team. And the last three years, it all ends with them getting to the NFC title game. So yeah. I will not doubt them regardless of whatever shenanigans they get up to. All right, that is our first one. Second one, one that I'm a little less confident in, that would be mm. the Cincinnati Bengals who left it all out there, man. They left it all out there in Baltimore. Yeah. They An incredible game from Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase. They go for two in the final minute. They don't get it. They fall to the Baltimore Ravens. They are four and six, despite having a top 10 offense, despite having the leading passer in the NFL, despite having arguably the best receiver this season in the NFL. Cincinnati Bengals, where do you stand with them and their current right. play? Because it's incredibly impressive for a team that's two games below 500. It's, it's, it's nonsensical is what it is because you're right. Joe Burrow is playing some of the best ball of his career. He clearly understands it's a contract year for Jamar Chase because he is feeding him the ball every chance he gets and even some chances where he probably shouldn't. They are ninth in offensive EPA per play. Four of their losses have come by three points or fewer this season. And they've scored 30 or more points in three of those four. Like, that's an incredible just thing to wrap your mind around that offensively, this team is so productive. They are so good. They can seemingly score at will. And somehow they are still running into these situations, albeit it's against a division rival and one of the best teams in the league in, in the Baltimore Ravens twice where they are going toe to toe with these guys. And the difference in these games is a, a, a penalty. It's a, you know, a, a, a no call. It's, it's just one of those things where it, it, it's a, it's a coin flip and they 
have come out on the wrong side of it. Maybe they're just picking heads every time. Who knows? Um, they're coming out of the wrong side of it. But I really do think that, especially with the defense getting better slowly but surely. Is it? it, it I mean, it's better than it was in the beginning of the season. I think that's true. And it's a testament to how far the Bengals could still improve that. I mean, they gave up 35 to Baltimore. They gave two two weeks ago. They gave up 37 to the Philadelphia Eagles, just offered nothing in the way of resistance after yeah. the first few possessions. I actually went and looked this up. And this is why this is this is my inspection for the Bengals current play, even knowing everything Joe and Jamar are doing for this team. I have to say no. Really? Yes. Right, I said yes. You said no. Their current level of play isn't good enough because it's not getting the results, Carm. It's not getting the results against the better teams that they have to play. What do you want? I mean, okay, so let's let's break down then some specific examples of what we need them to do better that is going to result tangibly in wins because I just I'm I, I don't I don't come up with much. Here's when what I, look I need at that. them to do, and I went and looked this up. Okay, I was just curious. Right. Uh, one, two, three. Four times this year, they have allowed either the highest or the second highest point total in the NFL for that given week. Like they have a 35, 37, 41, 38, 26. How are you winning in the NFL doing that on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. And I, I know stopping Lamar Jackson and Derrick Henry is tough to do. But uh, stop. Again, Philadelphia, seven straight possessions with points. Jaden Daniels, who set like every record imaginable for completion percentage and efficiency in that Monday night game in Cincinnati. I need something more from the Cincinnati defense because it, this it, level of imbalance is not sustainable. And we know that because they're four and six. That's true. But that then brings me to their remaining schedule, where could it be as simple as they're not going against the Baltimore Ravens again? They're not going against the Philadelphia Eagles anymore. They're not going against a surging Washington Commanders team with a rookie quarterback that is playing out of his mind confidently, all of that. The remaining schedule, I mean, that is this, this, that it could be as simple as that. That is my case for optimism. Okay. For the Cincinnati Bengals. Same. They do not play another offense that's top 10 in offensive DVOA the rest of the way. They play the L.A. Chargers this coming week. They're a respectable 13th, but certainly nothing like you're seeing from the Baltimore Ravens, the Washington Or even the Eagles, yep. Philly. They also, if you're seeing it, if you're watching it right here, they get to play three of these last eight games, or excuse me, seven games, because they've played 10. You get to play three of them against some truly woeful teams, Dallas, Tennessee, Cleveland. Now you have to sweep those games, right. which again, we can't even fully trust the Bengals to do that. Cause we've seen them with some puzzling results this year. I mean, I know it was the season opener, but I'm going to continue to harp on losing a home game to the new England Patriots as a big part of the reason why you're even in this mess. Yeah. But with that said, this is a team that was five and six last year when they lost Joe Burrow and they rallied to nine and eight with Jake Browning. And in 2022, they were five and four and I believe didn't lose again the rest of the way. So they do know how to do this, Yeah. but man, it would be, it would be nice to see them start to do it. You know, we're, we're getting late in the year here and I just need to see more. It's, it's funny because when I looked at their schedule earlier, like, to start the season, you look at that late bye and you're like, ugh, that's tough. This could be the best thing for them. The bye always comes at the perfect time, no matter where. No it matter is, what, right? I know that's so true. But like you now have an opportunity where if you run that you could run the table after your bye. And if you do what you're supposed to do on the bye week, you get a chance to take, you know, to take a breath, to reset some things, to figure out what's, you know, what the rest of the season is going to look like. And when you are playing some teams that are struggling, this is really an opportunity to come into form. And I really do think that it's set up in a way that should promote more success for the Cincinnati Bengals, because we know that their offense is extraordinarily productive. And then by virtue of going against not as tough opponents, theoretically, I'm not making assumptions necessarily, or I guess I am making assumptions, um, that should cut down on how many points you're allowing. 
if you have any sort of pride defensively. <laughs> I saw the Bengals uh, were working out my old friend, your old friend as well, Lombardi Lenny Fournette. Maybe they'll add uh, him to their practice squad. Zach Moss on IR. Maybe having more offensive balance can help them a little bit. They did get Khalil Herbert from the Bears. They did They did that as well. So, right, so they have a running back, uh, another running back to kind of balance that offense out. The schedule sets up favorably, and we can roll that into intangibles for the Bengals, mm. which... I'm gonna. I'm always gonna give a big yes to that. When yeah. you, you mean the combination of Burrow and Chase, what they're doing week in and week out. Again, the confidence that this team has not quite to the level of a 49ers, but like this is a team that believes in itself to be there at the end of the year and has seen itself stack wins together. On top of that, if you're following along on a Tuesday, Zach Taylor did update the status of T Higgins and Orlando Brown, nothing concrete, but I feel positive that at least one of those guys will be able to play Sunday against the chargers, maybe even both. And if you can considering what the Bengals are doing with just Joe and Jamar, right. Getting T Higgins back into this offense on us on a consistent basis. We saw, I mean, we saw wonders. the boost when, you know, he missed a couple of games to start the season. And then the, the first boost of their season came when he got back into the lineup and was able to take some of that attention and pressure off of Jamar Chase. But honestly, I mean, the intangibles for me are what you mentioned first off, which is Joe and Jamar together and that connection, that LSU Tiger connection. Okay, you I didn't gotta, have to I, say it. Just trying to make me feel better about what happened over the weekend. I I, I, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, I feel for you. The uh, this is according to Next Gen Stats. I found something a little fun. Jamar Chase caught 11 of 17 targets for 264 yards, which was 96 yards over expected, and three touchdowns in Week 10 against the Ravens went off. My AWF off, giving him the two highest single game receiving yardage outputs this season, which both came against the Ravens. So against the toughest team you were going to go against, Joe and Jamar went again, off, AWF off. They love that pressure. They thrive off that pressure. And now you've basically done that with the entire season where the Bengals backs are against the wall. And I only expect good things to come from Joe and Jamar and that connection that they have, which is so incredibly special and so incredibly, incredibly not tangible, um, even though there are obvious statistics that come out of that. It's just how special that is and how much that wills the rest of the team uh, forward. So I'm, I'm not worried about them uh, as far as intangibles go. I'd feel so much better about these guys if they had managed to win one of these Baltimore games. And I know they almost did though. That's, that's the I'm worst saying. part. It's it the, came down to like just the littlest thing. It's the thinnest margin of yep. defeat for a season sweep that I think I've ever seen losing in overtime and then losing on a two point conversion at the very end of regulation. But that's the way it goes. I do think it's interesting. The football power index gives the Bengals a 37% chance to make the playoffs, which is the best of any of like anybody outside the top six. So better. So right now in the standing, Cincinnati is behind Denver and Indianapolis, mm. but the football power index says they have a better chance to make the playoffs than both of those teams. Even if winning the division seems like a long shot for Cincinnati, you're two games below 500. You will take a 40% chance to make the playoff Absolutely. field. And that is why I think we're going to be in agreement. Maybe this will age poorly. Our Bengals takes have been aging poorly throughout the season. They have. I still think this is a wild card team when it's all I, said and done. I do too. And maybe that's just wishful thinking because they're fun as hell. They're fun as hell. Get it together, boys. Come this, on. We all we're all rooting for you. Well, that fans of the other three AFC North teams are yelling at their speakers, right? I, absolutely no, we're not. All right, if you have no AFC maybe Chiefs North fans allegiances. As well. Yeah, probably that too. They don't want to meet them in the playoffs. The playoff field would be better. I was just going to say the league these... is better when the Bengals are in the playoffs. Yeah. So fi figure it out or 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 I don't know. Make us look smart. Try That's to all find we want. some semblance of balance here, but I do feel good about the Bengals when it's all said and done. Let's wrap it up with a team that is currently sitting in the playoff field. Which of these three teams prior to the season, I don't know that we would have expected this one to be the one that's already sitting in the playoffs. I'm going to do my best to own this as much as I can for the dedicated Chargers fans. 
I did not think highly of this team heading into nope. the season. They were shedding salary. They did not do a whole lot to try to improve the team in free agency. They obviously got rid of Keenan Allen. There was questions about and Mike Williams, who just scored they got a rid of beautiful yep. touchdown. They got rid of Mike Williams as well. There was questions about uh, Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack, whether mm -hmm. they'd be there. Austin Eckler gone as well. I I didn't give enough credit to how high the floor might be with Jim Harbaugh as the coach in L.A. I think yeah. that's the biggest that that was my biggest error because Jim Harbaugh can coach some damn football, man. Sure can. He turned Stanford into a winner. He did. He and got seeing, to three got, straight NFC title games in aging, San Francisco. That's aging better and better every year. I, I don't think it'll ever happen again no. in modern college football. Turn Michigan into a winner. So I, I, didn't, I didn't give enough credit. Let me correct myself. He took Michigan to the championship game. He didn't. Michigan fans are going to yell at me. Michigan, right. Michigan was always good but he got them to the highs that they so desperately wanted to reach. Please don't come for me, Wolverine fans. Point that's being. Not a, that's not a fan base you want to piss off. Jim Harbaugh has raised the floor of this team to the point right now, dude, by the same football power index I just quoted for Cincy, 88% chance to make the playoffs. Did not see that coming. Now, my question for you is, can they maintain it? Right for the second half of the season. And I'm not ready to say no definitively, but I have I have more questions about the LA Chargers than two teams that are mathematically in a worse place. Yeah, I think that's true. And I don't know whether that is just knowing that even this team, when you, again, look at what they did or didn't do at free agency, what they did or didn't do prior to the season, um, that's where I like they didn't even really think that they were here yet. You know what I mean? That they yes. that this this was going to be a viable year for them. That's a more of a testament. It looked for to all the world like this was a team that was, was going to rebuilding, reset the salary right. cap, and and we'll see where we're at this year. We'll play better football than we did, but last year. But that's a honestly, low bar to clear. I, there's something that I need to own too, because for as much as I preach about the trenches and how important building from the inside out is when you're building your teams. I did not give the Chargers enough credit. I did not give Jim Harbaugh enough credit, despite the fact that I know that the most important thing to Jim, Jim Harbaugh is in fact the trenches, the offensive line. He knows exactly how important they are to the overall health, offensive health of a team. And they went out and they got Joe Alt and they have him opposite Rayshon Slater. They have a wonderful offensive line. It is now turning into, I think, you know, early in the season, there was, it was a lot of run first kind of what we're used to from seeing Jim Harbaugh. But what we're seeing over the last few games now is that Justin Herbert is now flourishing and looking more about like the quarterback that we know he can be. I mean, the defense, I'm not, I don't know if I'm sold on them, but I don't know if that's just me being a little bit distrusting for whatever reason, they have, they're tied for the fourth most sacks this year. They have 31 sacks. Ninth in defensive DVOA, sixth in success rate against the pass. I saw this, uh, this stat from our friend Peter Schrager, who put it on X or Twitter, whatever it's called, on Monday. Just the fourth defense since 1990 to hold its first nine opponents to 20, 20 points or less. or less. And that 20 was Pittsburgh back in week three. And that it was just 20 points. That's the high for the season. I know. And I keep being best like, scoring defense in the league, 13 points a game. It's I'm trying. And I think, I think there's part of that too, that it, that it hasn't been the toughest road yet for the chargers, but what's happening with Justin Herbert is what also gives me optimism that even when, and the, when the competition gets stiffer, I mean, over the last four games, Justin Herbert leads the league in big time throws with 13, according to PFF, and has zero turnover worthy plays in that span. He is the highest graded quarterback per PFF in that span of the last four games. He has, again, flourished now with the foundation of a good offensive line, a good rushing attack, really good rushing attack. Shout out J.K. Dobbins. And now we're seeing him get to the level where this this offense is extremely well-rounded under Jim Harbaugh, which is not something that I thought 
we would necessarily see, especially in the first year. So that come time for them to to go against some stiffer competition down the road, which they're going to get. Let's before maybe before, they can uh, making maybe they can uphold this. Which is why, for the current play, having said all of that, yeah, I'm I, on board. You're on board. Yes. I'm I'm not, and I'm going to tell you. Oh wait, why. am I not on board? I don't think I'm on board. I'm not on board because and of their competition. You want you want to hear some? St- and look, I I hate to do this. I really, this isn't college football. You play the team that's in front of you in the NFL, and <laughs> everybody's good, and all of that stuff, but. The Chargers' six wins have come against teams that are a combined 17 and 40. Yeah. They've played five of their nine games against teams that have three wins or less right now. And in their four games against teams that are 500 or better, they're one and three. They're scoring 14 points per game in those outings. The feather in this team's cap right now is a win against the Denver Broncos, which I will say it was a dominant win. Yeah. It, it was a much more lopsided win than the score would tell you because the final score was 23 16. If you watched the game, they were in control the entire way. Yes. Week. That still being your marquee win 10 weeks into the season just doesn't sit right with yeah. me. And that is why going into the upcoming schedule, I can also say. Yeah, it's a murderer. I have some big questions about that. You start this week with the Bengals. You move on to the Baltimore Ravens after that. It's Kirk Cousins and the Falcons after that. And then the return game against the Kansas City Chiefs, who they did play well. They did. They lost by seven to the Chiefs earlier this season, 17 to 10. Still didn't win that game. Mm -mm. And that's what's crazy is this is a team football power index says, you have an 88% chance to make the playoffs, just a 3% chance to win the division. That's how firm a hold Kansas City has on this thing, yep. even with the Chargers playing well. And then even it, after that. It is nice that they get to wrap up the season with Denver, New England, Las Vegas, like kind of a, a nice little cushion after this gauntlet here. But yeah, even Tampa Bay, who they play uh, in week 15. No, we just, I mean, we talked about it earlier where they are... <laughs> The fact that they have lost, what is it, three, four straight now? Um, four. Four, with just the slightest margin of error is just, they. It, that's a tougher game than their record suggests. I think that's true of the Denver Broncos, too. Their division game, too, those things get weird as it is. I do think, yeah, ending the season against the Pats and the Raiders, that could be like your breather, but you're going to have to get through a gauntlet as the Los Angeles Chargers before you get there. And so, like, yeah, I'm Just I'm my, with you. I'm, I'm a no for remaining schedule. I'm a no, schedule. absolutely. I'm a no. Until proven otherwise. And I'll happily come on here again and eat crow later if they run through this thing and and handle themselves. But I think it's about to get a hell of a lot harder. I mean, the the most impressive performance that they've had probably to date, other than beating a 5-5 five and five Denver team, I guess it's that loss to the Chiefs. You also, you went to Arizona. You had a chance to beat this Cardinals team that is surging right now, except they didn't score a touchdown in that game. Like, there there are some warts here, and I'm I'm excited about the Chargers because they're definitely ahead of schedule. I'm thrilled to see Justin Herbert playing as well as I know that he can, but remarkably for week 11 of the NFL season. I just, I don't think this is a proven team yet. Yeah, no, I don't either. I'm with you there completely. Um, Intangibles intangibles. wise though. So you got one nice ace up your sleeve and that is that the Jim Harbaugh effect is so real, dude. Yeah, it is. Did you see the post game video from their win against the Titans on Sunday? Yeah. Harbaugh's making everybody give high fives and they're like singing songs and doing cheers. You got the, who's got it better than us thing, (laughs) making Justin Herbert give post game speeches. I love, I love this guy. I love the effect that he has on an organization and to do it to the 49ers is one thing. Cause that is a proud franchise with a long history, but the chargers history is a lot of pain and suffering. I was going to say, you're not working with a whole lot to begin with. Yeah. You're kind of starting from scratch there. And honestly, maybe that's the best thing because Jim Harbaugh does, he spent so much time in college and he's, he kind of operates in this way of still trying to develop players, which is a good thing. 
but I do think that, yes, there's a Harbaugh effect. I do think there's another intangible here that we need to talk about, which goes back to something we talked about earlier. Go on. In that even the Chargers organization didn't think they'd be this far along in year one under Harbaugh. Nobody's job is at stake right now. No sweeping changes are going to come down the pipe. They are playing with house money at this point. However well they do this year is a bonus. If they make the playoffs, that is a bonus right now because this is year one. And if you're this far along in year one, there is only optimism for the future, no matter what happens down the stretch. And I have to believe that that matters because then you can just play and you can coach so freely and just try stuff, just try stuff. And if it works, it does. If it doesn't, no big deal. There's not this like overwhelming pressure that these guys are, you know, in danger of crumbling under. So I just think that that really affords them a lot of freedom. My buddy, Eric Smith, who works with the Chargers, tweeted this earlier today. Our buddy, actually. Our, our, I'm sorry, our buddy. It's a small world it here small world. in NFL media. Jim Harbaugh capped off his Monday presser for this coming week. Bengals here in L.A., SoFi Stadium. He said, we need those fans Sunday night. Big game at SoFi. And then pounded his chest twice. Like, Jim Harbaugh is 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 bringing that college vibe to the yes. Chargers. And w- first of all, we know it can work. Like this isn't people can be so dismissive of college coaches. Like Jim already did this yes. at San Francisco and he is bringing it to a team where it is so clearly well received. Whether right. it's, you know, the fan base looking for something to get enthusiastic about. And that's what I was going to say. All of like all of my memories of the Chargers post Ladanian Tomlinson probably mm. are something along the lines of the Chargers have the number one scoring offense and the number one scoring defense, but they're thirty <laughs> second in special teams and they're three games below five hundred. Like, how did this happen? Yes, or they're just an out and out disaster like they were last year. Like those are those are the two modes that the Chargers have existed in for most of Chargers the last. Chargers gonna Charger is a saying for a reason. Well, it won't be anymore. I know because they are a sound football team they are. and. Building it the right way. Everyone in that building is so excited to have this infectious enthusiasm. So I'm I'm giving it a big check mark. Yeah. Chargers win the intangibles battle. And I don't know if it's enough to overcome some of the harder matchups on this schedule. Because I do think the Chiefs and the Ravens and the, Bills. the I don't I don't believe they play the Bills, but the oh, yeah. the Chiefs. Oh, you're talking who they're playing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I just like some of these teams that they have to play are are better than them yes. just outright roster wise right now. But that doesn't mean that Jim Harbaugh can't find an edge and get this team prepared the right way to pull some wins like that off. So do they make the playoffs or not? <sighs> See, okay. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. How do I phrase this? Football Power Index says they're an 88% chance to make the playoffs. Yeah, does that take into account their remaining strength of schedule? I don't know. And w- it, it's only, they only rate it at like 15th in the league, which just seems crazy to me. So there's 14 other teams that have better playoff chances? That's what I have read. Okay, all right. But man, I, I'm with you. And that's what, so 88% chance to make the playoffs. I just need to see more. And so maybe maybe they will make the postseason, but for me right now, I I say no because I want to see more. I want to see how they handle this run that's coming up over the next month because I think this has been a uniquely easy beginning to the season. I mean, I, that goes against my experience covering the NFL. Right. But you just look at the schedule that's been in front of the Chargers this season, and it is – noticeably lacking from a lot of like true tests of what they're capable of. Yeah. I'm with you in the sense that again, I don't feel like this is a proven team, which you're right at this stage in the season when we're into double digit games, I, that usually isn't the case, but I think it speaks to the parody in the NFL right now. And I do think that I can make a better decision or projection. Literally give me two more weeks. Let, Let me see how they do against the Bengals and the Ravens. I'll even barter with you just to see how they do against the Bengals. 
can I just like, can I cheat right now and just say TBD instead of no? But oh. like, as of right this very second, I am not comfortable like slapping a green check on there and being like, yep, these guys are making the playoffs. But after they play the Bengals, and certainly after they play the Bengals and the Ravens, I think I might be able to give you a better idea. They are favored right now. As of Tuesday, they are favored at SoFi Stadium to beat the Bengals. One and a half point Vegas, Vegas knows stuff. I'm with but, you, though. But I do think, I mean, this Bengals team just has, again, everything to play for, all the belief. You talk about the intangibles there like we just did. I just, they're, they're better than their record suggests. If we want to call it an incomplete, we can. But okay, I don't, that would I, that would be me cheating. I don't, I don't cheating I, the system. I don't think it's going to make Charger fans feel any better about the X next to their name. But I know we'll see. The Chargers have every opportunity to prove themselves and to prove us dumb again, yeah. which they've already done. But hey, man, Cincinnati, Baltimore, Atlanta, Kansas City, all in a row. We won't have to ask a lot of questions about the Chargers after these next three or four games. That'll be interesting to watch. It'll be interesting to see how all of this ages. Because we did we did call for two teams outside the playoff bubble right now to make the field. And maybe one team that's in the field right now will fall out. We will see how all of that goes. This feels like a week where we can leave the Monday night recap for a little bit later in the show. But we're not going to ignore it completely. Mm. The Miami Dolphins... Come out to L.A. They beat the Los Angeles Rams 23-15 to on Monday Night Football. And, Carm, it, honestly, for most of the last five, six weeks, we've had a juicy, entertaining, dramatic Monday a Night heater. Football game. To Monday re- Night Football has been on a heater. It has been. It's been really good. Um, the streak comes to an end. <laughs> this was really more of a football game that just felt like it happened. Uh, our good friend, Benjamin Solak tweeted what in the Thursday night football is this and I've never agreed with anything more you know for all of the potential of Tua being back in the Dolphins lineup and and the Rams getting their receivers back this felt like it could be a fun game not really I think both teams put a lot of double safety looks on the field and dared each other to win underneath the Dolphins did a better job than the Rams did the Rams offensive line had a tough, tough night. Matthew Stafford was sacked four times. He was pressured a lot more than that. Yeah. Was going did to be an issue. Touchdown. Not only did they not score a touchdown, Carmen, did you realize, okay, so the Dolphins score a touchdown to go up 17-6 uh, to a finds Tyreek midway through the third quarter. And from that point on, we had five consecutive field goal, field goal drives. Goals, yeah. Five consecutive field goal drives before the Dolphins recover an onside kick. The Rams, I get that it's a tough spot to be, but Sean McVay just kept delaying the inevitable. Like every time the Rams scored, they had a, or every time they got the ball, they had a chance to score and make it a one score game. And every time Sean McVay was like, eh, let's just kick this field goal and it'll be an eight Even point right game. Even right at the end, like I know that you needed two scores and that the field goal puts you within one score. But what you were at the twelve yard line, right? Like, why? Why did you think that it would be any easier to score a touchdown, or why did you want to leave that up to chance on the next drive? Should you get that opportunity, scoring from the twelve yard line, I feel like is super probable, I, or much more probable than what you're probably going to get, you know, with time winding down and all that kind of stuff. It just didn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't know what the analytics say there, but that just that, no. I don't I don't really love Sean McVay's game theory on Monday night, but I also don't feel like the Rams deserve to win anyway, no. so it's not something I'm going to lose. They have lost about. four straight games on Monday night football. That is per Fox Sports research. I guess <laughs> it that makes sense though because this they've dealt with a lot of injuries in recent years. And when you go up against better teams in these primetime windows, I guess that makes sense. I do want to shout out Jared Verse, uh, who yeah. we we gave him the midseason often our defensive rookie of the year award last week. We did. And he did announce himself again in this game. Four tackles, uh, three of them solo, one sack, two tackle for loss. And he had the big strip play mm-hmm. uh early in this game where he Cody basically Turner showed up too. He he sacked Tua and stripped him all on his own. Like yes, it was a completely he did all of that by himself. Jared verse play. Okay. Then yeah, you got Kobe Turner too. I'm telling you, the Rams really 
not that they didn't do a one for one with Aaron Donald because you just can't do that when you're trying to replace a player like that. But they figured it out along that offensive or that defensive line. And they have quite a few young guys that are going to be good for a very long time. I feel like we've talked enough about the actual game here, given yeah. the product on the field. But I do. I just want to shout out, you know, this this line of conversation is going around the Internet in the wake of this game. And we just talked about teams on the playoff bubble. We just did playoff inspections earlier in this show. Mm. I'm not ready to do that for the Dolphins. Okay. Okay. You kind of they worried me just there. got their third win of the season. Right. They are mathematically a long shot, but maybe not as long of a shot as you think. Okay. They had a 22% Elaborate. chance to make the playoffs going into this game. And they have that one of the so pathetic that the AFC East, the AFC East, like with a three and six record that puts the Dolphins in second place in their division. Yeah. It's been a rough season for the AFC East it's by, uh, Hey, hilarious. it's me, a preseason jets believer over here. I, you wounds. should be embarrassed for how long you held on to that. Honestly. Well, I am. And we'll get to that in the power <laughs> rankings. So thank you. Carm. <laughs> Meanwhile. Okay. I was looking this up. Thank you for stalling the Dolphins playoff odds. In the wake of this win, have jumped to 31%. They don't have a terribly hard schedule. You know that you do have you have a trip to Green Bay at the end of November on Thanksgiving, I believe. You have a game against the Texans, a game against the 49ers. It's not all easy, but I see the Raiders on here. I see the Patriots. I see the Browns. I see two games against the Jets. A winning record is not out of the realm of possibility for the Miami Dolphins. Look at the state of the AFC. I mean, yeah. Denver's in the seventh seed at 500 right now. Being just near 500 puts you in the conversation. The Dolphins can make a little noise here. Crazier things have happened. Got well, yeah. Raider, Raiders and Patriots back to back up next. If you handle your business against those teams, you're you're in the mix at 500, and we can have a real conversation about the Miami Dolphins. My, I suppose. I suppose you do have to. Am I making a case at all? You are, but you do have to take into account teams like the Cincinnati Bengals, who aren't near 500, but we are fully expecting them to surpass that record and get a lot better towards the end of the season, even if it is wishful thinking, I guess, on our part. This does feel like a year where a few teams that haven't been playing good football in the start of the year are going to have a chance to make some noise. Whether that's Miami, Cincinnati is another team. The San Francisco 49ers can't rule out. The Buccaneers making a surge. Yes. And also, even in the wake of a very deflating loss, the Rams are right there in that mix as well. So add Miami to the list, I think, is the is lesson. Is it like a watch point. list? Maybe it's a watch list. Yes. Yeah. Everybody's favorite term. It's that time of year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the hunt. In the hunt, right. It's, They're technically in the hunt. It's in the hunt season. It sure is. Officially. And the Miami Dolphins, I think. At three and six. Are in the hunt. They're circling around the hunt. They're putting their... They're provided provided Tyreek Hill doesn't miss a whole lot of time after injuring his neck on a celebration with Odell Beckham Jr. That's an issue for the preview episode for next week. Here on <laughs> Tuesday, in the wake of Monday Night Football, the Miami Dolphins get the win over the Rams. Carm, always fun talking ball with you. Chat with you soon. Okay. I'm going to be real honest with y'all. Sorting out the power rankings for week 11 was a stressful endeavor. Feels like... The bottom class of the NFL is more crowded and competitive, if that's the right word for it, than, than I'm used to. There are 11 teams with three or fewer wins in the NFL this year. Just a lot of jockeying for position in the bottom rung of the league, and it's stressing me out. The top is pretty easy to figure out. Like, one to about 12 makes perfect sense, and all hell breaks loose right after that. So it's tricky. But I, nevertheless, I'm going to push forward with the Week 11 Power Rankings. You see them on the screen if you're watching. We'll start at the bottom with the current most disappointing team in the league, in my opinion. That would be the New York Giants falling all the way to dead last, five spots down after a disappointing overtime loss to the Carolina Panthers. Hey, the Panthers are playing better football since Bryce Young returned to the lineup, but this is still a game the Giants were favored to win by as much as a touchdown. They are not a good football team. It is not a surprise to me that as they go into their bye week, Brian Dable was non-committal 
about whether or not Daniel Jones would be their starting quarterback on the other side of it. Here's a hint. The vast majority of Daniel Jones's salary for 2025 becomes guaranteed if he gets hurt this year and can't pass a physical in 2025. I don't know for sure that it happens after the bye week, but I don't think Daniel Jones will be the Giants' starting quarterback for much longer. It has been a rough season in New York. Up at number 24, I bumped the Saints pretty high for their first win in the Darren Rizzi era, up eight spots to number 24. And it's not just because they won. They won against a playoff contender. The Falcons lead their division at six and four. They knocked them off. Also, because of the clearly better effort we've seen from the Saints since Darren Rizzi took over, Everything about the vibes on this team look improved after the decision to fire Dennis Allen. You see that a lot. You just get a jolt of energy when you replace an an outgoing head coach with a new guy. On top of that, though, Saints quietly making some additions that matter. They're getting guys back from injury. Derek Carr's a big piece of that. Eric McCoy might be the next one. Their center got hurt all the way back in week three. Losing him was as huge of a part of this losing streak as losing Carr. And he could be back as soon as this week. Something to keep an eye on. I don't know what it means in the big picture, but I do think the Saints will be be playing better football moving forward. But up above them, I got to put the Panthers above the Saints at number 23 just because they just beat them. And the Panthers are playing entertaining football, maybe, maybe not good football. All right. We, we got to grade this stuff on a curve, but the Panthers have been a more watchable team in the last few weeks than they were for the whole season before that. Like I actually was entertained by the Munich game early on Sunday morning. Bryce young love the moment he's having Chuba Hubbard unsung guy gets a new contract. I see you Panthers. I don't know if you'll climb a whole lot higher than this, but it's been a nice two weeks, which First time we can say that in a long, long time. Jumping all the way up into the top 10. Even I, as a preseason believer of the Cardinals, I don't know if I would have ever guessed they would jump four spots into the top 10. Not just a win against the Jets, but a demolition of the Jets. Kyler Murray having an absolutely incredible season. He's been so efficient. Trey McBride making a superstar jump. Marvin Harrison Jr. coming along. They run the ball fantastically. We knew all, like, we could have guessed all of that, but the defense is having such a nice few weeks. We've talked about the lack of talent on that side of the ball. The pass rush has been lacking. The secondary needs playmakers. Maybe all that stuff is still true, but they're not playing like it right now. Jonathan Gannon doing a hell of a job coaching that defense up. Cardinals on top of the NFC West and into the top 10. Wrap it up with the big statement team of the week. Like I said, the the top of the power rankings look very similar when all the good teams keep winning. But the Pittsburgh Steelers had a big chance to make a statement, and they did. They went on the road. They knocked off the commanders in comeback fashion. I've got them up three spots to number six overall. Coming back from a 10-point deficit in the second half is not something we've seen this team do a lot recently. I was very impressed. The offense has a higher ceiling with Russ. The defense is a Pittsburgh defense, pass rush everywhere. And now they get to take on the mighty Ravens. And man, if they can do that, then what type of conversation are we having? Because even at number six, I do think there's a ceiling. Like right now, here as I'm doing this, I think there's a difference between the Steelers and the Ravens and the Lions and the Chiefs, but they got a chance to go out and prove it in a big AFC North rivalry this weekend. Cannot wait for that one. That does it for the power rankings. That does it for the show. Head on over to foxsports.com, Fox Sports app, if you want to see the rest of the power rankings, see my rationale for all of those picks, all of the movement. Make sure you head to Spotify, subscribe if you're not. Make sure we're in your feed on Thursday when we have our jam-packed Week 11 preview. So many big matchups this week. I just mentioned Steelers and Ravens. We've got Bills and Chiefs. We've got Packers and Bears. Oh, my. A fantastic week of football coming up in Week 11, and we will be here on Thursday to preview all of it. Make sure you're subscribed on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. We will talk to you then. I'm already pumped for it. Appreciate it, y'all. Talk to you soon.